here in the south. That felt, that was sweet water on the, on the tongue. Could we do that again today? <clears throat> I think we can. Amen. 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 Sing it, brothers. Amen. 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 He's up there. Amen. Amen. <laughs> he went. Amen. Oh, God, no. Amen. Two nil. Oh, oh, yeah. Amen. the golden hair, remember him? Why? Seems so long ago. You remember he said, I'm a man full grown, I'm ready. I'm ready to go to war. You remember that? You remember what the men said to him? We got a horse for you. Oh, yeah. Sure we do. You just wait till we're gone. You wait till we're all gone. And then you go look in this stable. Right? You remember when they told you that? You wait till we're gone. You go look in this stable. And there'll be a horse for you. He ran to that stable. He didn't walk, he ran. You know what it's like. You're waiting to see a horse with broad shoulders, steam from its nostrils, great swishing tail. A horse like that, the horse of power, that's what they promised. And in the dark of the stable, there it was, the little hippity hoppity, three-legged grief machine. A shitty little horse with three legs. Now you or I probably got on that horse because it was all we fucking deserved. You know that feeling? Yeah. Of course it's a three-legged horse. Of course all the men have already gone. Just that feeling that everyone has gone to some great battle but you. They've all gone to university and there you are still in the fields. But he remembered in the back of his head the rusty man and the thing he said if you ever find yourself in a spot you come to the edge of the great forest and you call my name three times would you call it with me now call it call it right now just like you were when you first heard it one two three I'm, I'm John, John. I'm John! I'm John! 
in an instance, like a flash of lightning, he was there. He said, what, what do you need? And the young man said, I need a war horse, for I'm going to war. And Iron John said, you shall have that and much more. And he disappeared into the trees. And soon enough, there came a stable boy. Right from where Iron John had disappeared, a stable boy leading a great horse with steam coming off its neck, smoke rolling out of its nostrils, and fire sparking from its ears and eyes. The eyes of this horse were a thousand years old, its hooves six thousand. Dancing on the sides of the flank of this horse were like cave paintings moving. All the great battles, maybe if you looked at the hide of this animal you saw Finn McCool, maybe see you saw Arthur, maybe you saw Taliesin. It was a great and magical beast, and we are all a little jealous to this day. And the stable boy took the gimpy little horse away, led him into the forest, and the boy took the great war horse. And then came Iron John, and behind Iron John came a great troop, a band of soldiers, warriors, great warriors, all clad in iron. And they came and they outfitted the boy. They accoutred him in all the good things of war. And he got on the horse and he led that band away. Maybe the men were singing. Maybe the men were singing. We know that pure gold sunlight shone on their weapons that day. We know that beauty was wrapped round their swords like delicate flowers. Never give a sword to a man that can't dance! They could dance. They could dance. And they went singing and they fell like an avalanche on the army that came to conquer that land. By the time they got there, the king and his armies were nearly defeated, nearly defeated. Oh, yes. Many, many, many men were dead. The ground was drenched in blood and the king knew that it was over. It was over he when suddenly, through the trees, they heard the sound, the great thundering sound of the iron band. And at their head came the boy with the golden hair in his armor, gleaming white and shining. And they fell like an avalanche, like a hurricane. And they routed that army. They sliced through that army like a hot knife through butter. They were persistent in their aggression and their inventiveness and their sheer skill. They followed the men to the last and they took no quarter. The king couldn't believe his eyes. And when every last man of the enemy had been driven into the ground, do you think that boy turned around and rode back to the king? Mm. Do you think he rode back to the king looking for some kind of a reward? Isn't that where you would have gone? What a good boy am I. Take a look. Quick, let me get my armor off. But Not a bit of it. That. He didn't do that. He went back to the edge of the forest. And he called. How did he call? Iron John! Iron John! Iron John! In a flash, he was there. And he said, Thank you for everything you have given me. Now can I have my little hippity hoppity horse back, please? In an instance, out came the stable boy. Out came the horse. 
and the dancing, singing, iron-clad, beautitious men moved back into the mist. And on that small little three-legged horse, the young man made his way back to the castle. Meanwhile, the beautiful princess Ah. ah was standing on the ramparts watching and waiting for the return of her father. And he returned. She congratulated him on his victory. She'd been worried about him. She was It quite worried. Her. She was convinced she'd never see him again. And she said, Father, what a victory. How great in stature you are, how noble in imagination, how far reaching your intelligence that you defeated. And he looked at her and he said, daughter, it wasn't like that. It wasn't like that. I thought, I thought my day had come. I thought my hour had come. The holy men were around me making libation and prayers. And then suddenly, like a shimmering dream, like a shimmering dream, something moved into the battle. And I have to tell you, daughter, it was sublime. It was sublime. I don't know who he was or where he came from, but some great force saved my life out there today. And she said, well, where the fuck is he? I'd like to I'd like to I'd like to get a know get to know a man like that. However, had you been there, even as she said it, she was conflicted. Because in her mind she was still thinking about the boy with the wild flowers. She had been glancing down into the garden and may she she maybe she hadn't seen him for a day or so. He was playing a good game. So in this conflict of these two imaginations, she put two and two together. And she began to think, she wondered. She did. And so she went down to the garden. And she found the gardener. And she said, gardener, mm -hmm. where, where has been your boy? Where has been your boy these days during, during the war? Well, he's, he's been uh, about, I think. Maybe I lost track of him. He, he had the little, did he have the little hippity hoppity horse? Did a little hippity hoppity horse? horse? And where did he go? She well, said, where did he go? I'm not sure. Well, I don't know. All I know, the gardener said, all I know is that when he returned, the men laughed at him and they said, oh, how did you do in the battle? How did you do in the battle? And he said, He said, Had I not been there, it could have gone some other way. They thought this was very amusing and slightly cryptic. <laughs> is it a metaphor? What the fuck is he talking about? But he knew. But still, He kept the gold underneath the cap. Can you imagine the temptation at that moment to show who you are under that kind of pressure with the whole basketball team there? Six foot four, dripping with PhDs, and still you keep your cap on. And so with this information, she left the gardener and she went back to her father. She said, Father, we must find the great hero that saved the day. What can we do? What can we do? If you have a daughter, and a daughter comes to you and she looks at you in a certain way, and she maybe talks about you in a certain sweet way for a moment, suddenly you're writing checks too. And you're making things happen for your beloved. <laughs> And he got to thinking, because he was troubled, that this character had come in. Who was he? Why did he not reveal himself to me? 
It irked him and it troubled him until he came up with an idea. I have an idea, my daughter, my sweetheart, and we can place you in the center of it. We shall call a great tournament and we shall gather all the machos in the land, all the great warriors, maybe a few poets, ones with elegant tongues, great clashing things, spears, a great thing. Surely something like that will attract this man. And the gift, of course, will be the golden apple. And you, my dear, you shall be the one to throw the golden apple and surely the greatest hero of all will be the very one will be the very one that catches the golden apple and then we will know him wouldn't you trade a scar or two for a golden apple from a woman like that i suspect many of you already have And so, we will leave her there, dreaming of throwing the golden apple and having it caught by the only one that should catch it. And we will leave the boy in the garden, wondering what will come next. That's just a short, a short piece, and it's very, if you're reading the story, there's a temptation you can skip over that. So much happens in the, in the first part of this story. It's a moment that really deserves some amplification. It deserves some focus. Uh, so we wanted to give you a beautiful fragment that we could really look into. So please, comments. Where's, where are you? I was very struck that he had learnt that he could call on the wild man oh. and that he actually thought to do so in the moment <clears throat> rather than trying to think, well, I'll make the best I can with this three-legged hippity hobbity thing. I will call on the wild man. And I was thinking in the context, again, of passivity. You know, how do I call on the wild man when I feel myself to be in that passive place? What is that call for me? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank good. You. It's good, Andrew. I love that you finished and started with him saying, I'm a man full grown. That for me has always been a difficult thing to think about. Looking in yourself and saying, "That's it. I'm, I'm, I'm not complete, but I'm a man, yeah. full grown." Yeah. And then the story changes from the forces acting on him to him taking his own action. Now he knows what he needs to do next. He, is, he you know, he doesn't get shown the path. He knows the path. He's a man, full grown. I, I love the story. Thank you, Richard. I'm thinking about the, the, the army that comes with him. And I'm, I'm thinking about how so often when something inspires you, something that you, when you do something great, so often it's, it's not, you know, it's not an ego thing. There's, there are either other people in community with you, mm. or there are voices that speak to you and, and bring it to you. And you have it, you know, you're, you're, you're kind of a, a conduit for something, in a way. And that, and that army makes me think of that. Because he, he swept in, and it's not as though he conquered the whole other army. He had this whole, this whole force that came with him. So, you know, that really struck me this time. Of what, what does all that mean? And to me, it feels like it means a lot of things. Yeah. You know, that it could mean community, but it, it could also mean the spirits. It could mean the ancestors coming with you. Um, I, I hadn't heard that before. Just in relation to that, I'm reminded of what Martin had to say yesterday about leadership, mm -hmm. about authenticity versus authority. Mm -hmm. You know, the authenticity of having a cause and believing in it and focusing on that as opposed to the ego, the authority, the author, author, you know, the, where the ego comes in and tells people what to do. I mean, he, he had that cause and it, it followed, you know, <laughs> maybe even the leadership role that you have or whatever, but 
that's what I hear in that army coming. Thank you. I'm kind of struck by the symbolism where in the beginning of the story you're talking about a golden ball, kind of a plague thing back and forth, whereas now he's presented with the possibility, or at least the golden apple is brought into the story. And I think back to like Christian mythology and the apple in the Garden of Eden that can be a representation of growing up. And that, you know, growing up, that the knowledge of good and evil and transitioning from a world of kind of others kind of taking care of you to coming into your own power and then going out and becoming a man. Yeah. I really like the uh, image of um, having to bring the, the lame horse, the three legged horse, to the forest. It's like, needing to take your shame and bring that to the mentor so that that can be uh, transformed into, into strength to protect the kingdom with your inner world. Like you really need to take that, that hurt and that grieving to the mentor to have that transformed so that you can protect you. That's very, very good. I never thought of that. That's very good. Uh, I was just uh, really struck by... Um that, that kind of indescribable pain of the moment when he gets his lame horse and the battle's already there yeah. and he missed it yeah. and yeah. he lost his opportunity. Yeah. Have you ever had that feeling in your life that something big and very exciting is happening just out of view? <laughs> at, at the periphery of your vision, something important is happening. I remember uh, I left school without any qual I don't have any school qualifications or anything like that. Uh, although I'm just finishing a PhD and they never asked. They never asked, did you graduate? So I just, <coughs> just carried on, so. Fuck them. Uh, but what I remember about that period was being stuck in the small town I came from and seeing every, all the bright nights leave. They left and they went to their Camelots and what I remember is a very long period of sleeping a lot because if I woke up for too long it was too painful so I started to sleep all of the time it's leave they left and they went to their camelots and what I remember is a very long period of sleeping a lot because if I woke up for too long it was too painful so I started to sleep all of the time it's very interesting I'll give one it's just if it's a killer um, after I left LA I hadn't quit the music business exactly but I'd left Los Angeles uh, and uh, and I was pretty broken up pretty chewed up and that year I watched the Grammys and a whole row of my friends that I had worked with were in the front row and they were all collecting Grammys that year and I was sitting in a little house on an island wondering what the fuck happened to me yeah. where where did I go so there's something extraordinary in this young man's life that he doesn't settle he doesn't settle for what he's given that's right that's extraordinary and I mean I can only imagine him when I feel the story is that it's something to do with the spring and it's something to do with seeing the gold in him and it's something to do with seeing his true face. And in some way that is sustaining him up until this moment. I found the part where you said, uh, you know, like, like if you know the feeling when everybody else goes off to university mm. and you're the one who, like, who's not, you know, and I, like, I really like that part because um, in my experience, all my friends, I went to a really, really well-ranked high school where you almost promised like something great if you, if you graduate. I barely graduated. Like yeah. I'm talking like like you've never seen so many Fs come that close. You can't remember one of these papers. So many Fs. Yeah. 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 And I, like, I didn't qualify for any colleges that I would have wanted to go to. Or like the dream schools I had, and I, I mean, it didn't matter because in my head I decided, well, they were all, all my best friends going off to University of George Washington, you know, Duke, like all these colleges. <coughs> I'm going to pay rent for the next two years and 
the shit whole side of Hollywood yeah. trying to make my music. You know? <coughs> and like I just, I just really like that part because it's um I've never heard in the story something's happened to really how I feel, you know. So I thought that was really good. That's good. Thank you. That's good. I appreciate it. Tim. There was a detail in uh, Robert's version of the story that struck me, and um, I, I'm a pacifist, basically, so the warrior stuff is a little troubling. Um, but in, in Robert's version, during the battle, the, uh, the description was that they vanquished all the men who resisted. And there wasn't a ruthlessness to just slaughter everybody. Mm -hmm. It was all those who resisted. And, and that struck me as, you know, a warrior who is truly a warrior isn't about to just slaughter people indiscriminately. They're doing it until the job is done and no further. Mm -hmm. And that ruthlessness didn't come in. And that, I felt that felt good to me. Mm -hmm. that, this young king, or whatever you call him at this point, was had that peace inside of him, just like the boy who would give away the coins to the children. There was something good about him that wasn't this brutal, militaristic, ruthless kind of mentality that I find very savage. Much. He was not savage, no. that's right. That's you got anything right. to say about that, Nothing. Tim has something. I, I know this story well, and I, I, I love how you pointed out um, after the battle how he didn't go to the king. And there's something about his, he's lost his neediness. Uh, and, and I suspect that it's his connection to be able to call on Iron John and his special magical side that's going on in his life that causes him to not need as much. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm struck by the same thing. How does a, a, a young man who has done something so wonderful and so powerful know that he's supposed to hide his gold? I mean, the temptation is so great, particularly someone who's been shamed or has had some problems with feeling good about himself. Where, where does that knowledge come from? Is it instinctual? Is it was it given to him by Iron John? Well, I think it's it's partly a social context. You know, uh, and it reminds me of what John was talking about, about the difference between ritual and ceremony. And if the boy had gone back to the king, he would have ended the ritual. Mm. He would have ended the ritual transformation mm. and asked for a ceremony before he was ready for a ceremony of confirmation. Mm. Do you see what I mean? But, but the culture, the society that we live in, encourages us to do, to do that. We should skip, you know, skip, we, not finish the grief or the ritual, whatever the fucking ritual is. Mm. We should skip the work mm. and go straight to the confirmation. Mm. Talking of, of sort of difficult and strange words, uh, something that I don't want to talk about too much now, but I will t briefly mention the words, is the difference between the word liminal and the word liminoid. Because what we're describing, when something ends too early, when an initiatory process never gets to its third stage, when there's no sense of a rite of passage, which is moving through something, you get what they call liminoid. Robert Moore speaks wonderfully on this subject. Um, and it's, it's a mistake to think in your own life, well, I've been through all these difficult times, and you know they're resolved and they're finished. You, it may be interesting to pay attention to when in your life something was stult, stulted prematurely, when it hadn't played itself out. But of course, your friends want, want you as you were. They don't want you as you are. So that's something where you're, you're close to the liminal. You're close to, to the initiations that tribal people understood, but you're still not quite connecting to the thing that has the alchemy in it. So one thing we can say about this difference between liminoid and liminal is that the liminal is distinctly connected to something sacred. Mm. The liminoid resembles the liminal, and therefore it is liminal, but it doesn't have the sacred connection. Mm. So one answer to your question is, how does he do that? It's through 
somehow someone has provided him with a connection to something sacred. Mm -hmm. I want to say something about the <clears throat> uh, what you said about how do you know uh, to go back to Iron John rather than go to the king. And one of the things that it flashed on when you said that was his relationship with Iron John was, was different than the king in that when he released Iron John and Iron John took him in the woods and gave him tasks to do, he was forgiven. He knows that Iron John has forgiveness in him. He also knows he sent him on a pathway. He didn't really banish him or abandon him because he said, come anytime you need me, come back and I'm there for you. His relationship with the king in the story, the one piece of that we have is when he took the food to the king, the king said, get out of my sight, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and get out of my kitchen. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking, if I'm the golden boy, if I'm the boy, I'm going back to Iron John and thank him and show proper gratitude yeah. for that gift. It's, it's the difference between grandiosity and greatness. That's what it is. It's the difference between grandiosity and greatness. He is also the son of a king, isn't he? The beginning of the story. So he's seen all this shit before. He grew up in it. You know, everywhere he wanders, there's a, a pelican neatly sculpted into a hedge. You know, that's his whole thing. <laughs> you know, just plucking that out of my ass. But um, so he's had an experience, as Danny is saying, he has a connection to the sacred. And it's something that he seems to be honoring and it seems to be tempering him as he goes. He's seen the grandiosity and now he wants the greatness. As Robert makes very clear in the book, there is the wound uh, in, in the initiatory process mm. that connects us to something sacred. Mm. It's delivered in a sacred manner, it's connected mm. to something sacred, mm. and therefore it sets a precedent for us to reinterpret all our subsequent woundings mm. as being connected to something sacred. There's something here at, at, at this point that actually connects to, to what John's been talking about with passivity. This, this, uh, the, the boy in the story isn't looking for, isn't doing what he's doing to get approval. He's a That's prince, right. and a prince is a king in waiting. The kingdom is already his, ultimately. He's not, he didn't win the battle to save the king. He won the battle to save the kingdom for him. Mr. Elderman. I don't know if this makes sense or not, but when he's going back to the pump, right, and, and the, the finger turns to gold, Iron John comes back, you know, basically scolds him and says, oh, you know, I'll give you another chance. And then the hair, again, the same thing, I'll give you another chance. But then the hair falls down, and this time it's completely gold and says, oh, that's it, you're out of here. In his psyche, and now he set it up this way, but in his psyche there's all the shame anyway it's about his having failed. You know, so the failure again is carrying him. So I think the failure is also inhibiting him from showing his hair, from you know, doing the thing with the king, with the queen. It's like he still has that part in him, and that's a necessary part of carrying that failure to get into where he needs to go. I don't know if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Uh, what I want to say um, about this, about uh, the integrity and congruency that. He, and it goes back to what was said about the, his mission to save the king or save the king or the kingdom. And what I, I understand is when forces move us inside of us, it's not that we have a reward or there's something on the other end or he would have gone to the king or he would have gone to the king, killed the king and then taken the kingdom. It's because he couldn't do it any other way. Mm. And said, that's his nature. He can't do it any other way. He can't go to the king. He goes back. It's his nature. It, to go into a battle, it's his nature to go into battle. A warrior's nature is to go into battle. A lover's nature is to be a lover. And that's, that's the completion of whatever that is, of whatever the force is, whatever that energy is. So we want, to, we want to make it about us. We want to make it about who we are, um, about our view of the world. And, and maybe um, what, we need, what, what needs honor, just the force that moves inside of each of us. As a father, there's certain things you do. You can't do it any other way. You can't help but put the dishes in the dishwasher. You understand? Mm -hmm. You can't do it any other way. Mm -hmm. You can't help but read the child to uh, story to your child. Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> Thank you. Thank you.
Yeah, uh, something that struck me, and I don't know what to do with this, it seems to me that the boy's relationship with Iron John has changed here, too. That before, it was an active teaching mode kind of thing, you know, saying don't do this, and then he does it, and there's some kind of teaching going on there. And now the boy is coming back, and Iron John is saying, what do you need? It, it's, it's a different flavor to that relationship, and then providing it for him to go and do what he needs to do elsewhere and come back instead of in the woods around the pond. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to say anything about the psychological stuff. I just want to say how my body felt when you were presenting that, that I felt goosebumps, energy running through my body, and my blood pumping, and my heart coming out of my chest, and uh, just exhilarating, you know, so. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, I just wanted to say the same thing. I have, I have tears pouring down my face. Wow. Uh, you know, I want to hear thank you. This is really, really like giving this thing life. And I know we're doing it together. But yeah. That's very gracious. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I had a different reaction. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't take long. <laughs> There's going to be a fight. Yeah. I got really pissed off at the glorification of the army. Yes. Having been to Vietnam, I've yeah. seen battles, I've yeah. seen wounds, mm -hmm. I've seen people die, mm -hmm. and I've seen them die slow. Yeah. And it is not pretty, it's yeah. not glorious, it's not something to be exalted. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I have to admit, when the army comes out, my chest starts to feel proud. And I'm angry at the same time. Mm -hmm. I think that's appropriate, Larry. Yeah, that's a I think that reaction. is appropriate. You know, to feel that up, upwelling of, you know, doing what we have to do and being angry that it has to be done. It's wrong. I, I'd like to hear what Orlin has to say about what some Floyd and <coughs> other people said about that this is his nature. I think it was... I don't know, I think it was Walton that said, he knows he's the king. He's, he's already the king, and he doesn't. And, and it starts with me of not knowing. I show, I mean, if I have any, I show my goal. You know, and I'm just learning at this, at this phase of my life, the last several years, to just shut, the, <coughs> shut up about my goal and just, to just do it or, or, or sort of allow things to happen from behind the scenes. Well, there's more than that. Forget that part. Just answer the part about um, <laughs> about is it is that part of the what, what I think you said was an ancestral knowledge, or because uh, I still don't totally get that, but that he knows that's who he is. The, the, the challenge is that we can't just live in our nature. We have to live in culture as well, and the the culture gives the initiatory context for how you would use your nature, but you still have to go through culture. He cannot, like, the, the edge, the place where he returns back to is the memory. He remembers the fact that he can go and call on help. But he can't stay there. That's not where he's to stay. We have to go back and retrieve certain things in our own nature. But the fact is that your life makes sense in the culture. That's where you have to pay your dues. And so the, the, the dynamics is not either or. It's the transformation of both as we actually walk through the whole initiatory step. The okay. culture will change if you go far into your nature. But you can't access your nature until you're challenged by your culture. Beautiful. the prince. He can't become the king until he's gone through that apprenticeship. Iron John is he's mentor in that. And the thing where he obviously needed the, the biggest lesson he had to learn before to become the king is 
to be able to, um, to protect the sacred element in the kingdom. And that was the, the sacred pool. He, he failed three times to observe the boundary there. And he, in a sense, I guess it's paradoxical, but he allowed things to fall into the pool that weren't supposed to go there. But he, somehow that he still, in doing that, he received some of that sacredness himself. But he hadn't learned how to protect it. And then he went through this experience. We talked about this in our bucket group. Um, he, he had to understand, he had to do the brief work, and he had to be with ashes and in the garden, and learn a lot about uh, boundaries and, and skills and so forth that would ultimately give him the strength to protect the sacredness of the kingdom. And I, the, I love the warrior energy in that for the first time. I'm not a warrior type guy, as everybody here immediately recognizes. <laughs> I love the warrior energy in that because that's getting close to the culmination of his having the capacity to defend the sacred in the kingdom. That's all it is. It's not, it's not an element of ruthlessness in this man. But he, what he's, what he's learned, and all the time in my mind, all he's connected to in terms of Learning, it's all these, he's, back, it's, it, he's aware of the fact that he's in this apprenticeship with Iron John, the king, the princess, all that. They're not big to him. Iron John is still big to him because he knows he has this to learn. And so finally, you know, it's going to go on. But the part about where he goes out and he, he kills these men, it's really, he's just protecting, he's protecting that sacredness. And uh, he's grown a lot at that point. Okay. Oh, we we'll also have to hold, be very careful of not over literalizing this story. If this is a story, and it's about forces that live inside of us, it's about uh, an alchemical transformation. It's about the cultivation of the imagination. You know, you see what I'm saying? And so these powers arise if we don't have enough imagination, then we get overwhelmed. We get overwhelmed by an annihilating force. That, that's kind of what this battle could be seen mm. to be about. Yeah. Now, we've only got time for two more questions, so one from you, please. I just want to say that I think that there's a, a, a really big difference between um, the evil wars and the slippery agenda of, of nations mm. and, um, and, and what has happened in that way um, and learning to be a warrior to protect your own kingly energy. Mm -hmm. I think those are really different things, sort of separating the archetypal warrior from the soldier, maybe. Yeah, it's uh, good. Um, I, too, never really related to the battle part um, until my pacifist brother over there spoke up, and I was reminded of a um, reference that Joseph Campbell made about um, it was about the angel that shows up on Judgment Day bearing a sword. And that the sword isn't there to kill, it's there to open up. And that to those who are, are closed, it feels like a death. Um, and what you're saying, I forget the <coughs> wording, but it was something about those who resist, that, that those were the ones who... who were vanquished. Yeah. Were, were vanquished in the battle. I, I now see it. That battle is in, in, in a different light. That perhaps that's. Um, I don't know. I haven't completely thought this out, but that's sort of like his bringing of um, his uh, presence into the world and how it opened some people up. And, and I. I I don't know, I'm still processing yeah. that. But. There's a great line from the poet Diane de Prima. She says, the only war is the war against the imagination. All other wars are subsumed in it. Mm. Wow. Thank you for all of that. <laughs>